we get on some Zoom calls with some of these customers that were in my coaching program. And I was like, hey, can I just like run this thing by you? Type in your business name and it's gonna spit out like a headline. And that was magic. And people would just be like, holy bleep, give me access. How can I get this today? And it was just like, people were ravenous on these Zoom calls. And up until then, everything we'd ever done, I had never had that reaction before. Welcome to Wish I Knew, the show about the revelatory aha moments that founders, CEOs, and leaders discover along their own business journeys, and why taking risks leads to growth. I'm your host, David Cowan. And on today's episode, we're doing a dive into arguably the buzziest sector of technology of the moment. That's right, we're talking AI. Now, for many, the idea of AI, which stands for artificial intelligence, can be daunting. And although it's recently taken the world by storm, the term artificial intelligence was actually coined back in 1956, when four people, John McCarthy, Marvin Minsky, Nathaniel Rochester, and Claude Shannon, organized the Dartmouth Conference and laid the foundation for AI as a formal research discipline. And while the term artificial intelligence has been around for decades, it's at this moment that the technology is being applied at breakneck speeds to healthcare, finance, transportation, and even to marketing. Which is where we find ourselves for today's episode, exploring a company that's leading the charge in AI-generated marketing copy. And that company is Jasper. Jasper uses AI to create original content for just about any marketing need you can think of, from Instagram captions to YouTube topic ideas, blog posts, article headlines, maybe even this podcast intro. It's like having your very own robot sidekick with an infinite supply of ideas. Exactly. That's right, Jasper. So today's guest is none other than Dave Rogenmoser, co-founder and CEO of Jasper, a company that in just 18 months went from launch to unicorn and is now valued at $1.5 billion. With such acceleration, there's a lot to learn. And as computing power continues to increase and data sets become even larger, the possibilities for AI are virtually limitless. So with that, let's get into today's episode featuring Dave Rogenmoser, which is moderated by our mutual friend and my partner at Bessemer, Samir Delakia. Well, welcome everyone to the Wish I Knew podcast. We're so excited to welcome a friend and amazing CEO and entrepreneur, Dave Rogenmoser from Jasper. Please say hello, Dave. Ready to rock and roll. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a super fun conversation. So let's get started with the basics. Go ahead and just introduce yourself. Tell us your name and what you do. Yeah, I'm Dave. I launched Jasper about two and a half years ago. We basically help marketing teams write really high quality content that's on brand and in their tone of voice and do it much, much faster so they can get great marketing results from all their efforts here. So we've been using the AI to help do that and been scaling really quickly over the last two years. I have had the privilege of getting to know you over the past couple of years and a huge part of our interest, my interest in investing in Jasper was you. So the next question for you is, how would you say that others describe you? They would probably describe me as a guy that likes to think strategically and I'm the guy that's kind of coming up with the new ideas or I'm the guy convincing all my friends to like buy board ape <laughs> yacht club jpegs <laughs> all of that yeah you know family man you know I've got three little boys five three and one that are wild you left off amazing golfer that can hit the ball 300 yards off the tee but I, <laughs> I, I'm gonna throw that in uh, I appreciate that I do like playing golf a lot <laughs> all right well let's talk about your entrepreneurial journey because it's been an extraordinary one you co-founded Jasper with two amazing guys who I've had the pleasure to get to know, Chris Hall and JP Morgan. But Jasper was not the first venture that the three of you worked on together. Maybe just share with the listeners a little bit about how you met those guys and what made you want to go into business with the three of you. Yeah, so I was working for this campus ministry at the University of Missouri and thought that I needed to go learn how to start a business and didn't want to go get like a regular job and was reading some books on like what that looked like. I didn't know any founders. I didn't know what that was. I grew up in Topeka, Kansas, where we didn't have founders. You know, you might have like the guy, <laughs> like there was a guy that owned a few Wendy's. Yeah. That was like the big like business guy that I knew of. And so I went to this wedding. I sat down next to Chris, who I like knew loosely. I was like, hey, what are you doing these days? He said, well, I'm starting a software company. He goes, I'm taking this course that teaches you how to start a software company with no idea and no money. And I was like, 
that's me. He's like, and best of all, you don't need to know how to code. So like no skills, no idea, and no money. And as you can hear in Dave's voice, this opportunity was music to his ears. So he took the leap and enrolled in the course, officially kicking off his founder journey. So I went through this course that kind of taught how to do that. And you'd talk to customers. You'd basically let them describe the product to you. You'd kind of idea extract this thing out of the market. And then you'd go hire somebody on Upwork to go and build it for you. And eventually he and JP were working on one company. I was working on this other company and we kind of made an agreement. We're like, Hey, like whenever like anyone starts making money, we'll just team up together on like that thing. Ah. And so I ended up pivoting and, and started this marketing agency that teaches you how to start a marketing agency with no money and no idea and no understanding of marketing and basically got that working and convinced them to come over and work with me on that. And we just, really wanted to build a business around our friendship and be committed to each other in that. And, you know, we didn't have any grand plans of building something huge. We just didn't want to have to go get jobs. And we wanted to just enjoy the process. So Dave and his two buddies set off on a new venture back in 2014 to try to build a successful marketing agency. But once that business was built, it was time to set some founding goals. When the three of you got together and said, hey, we're going to start this business, what were your expectations around how much revenue the business could build or how much it would be worth someday or anything like that. I had written down on this note card years before, by the age of 30, I wanted to be financially free by starting multiple profitable businesses and creating passive income streams. And my goal on there was to, to make $30,000 a month was like total freedom, you know, never have to like think about money again. And you know, all these things. It's <laughs> so like, at some level in my mind, like that was the goal, even though I wasn't kind of like aiming for that necessarily. But yeah, we just wanted to build a nice little business, have some employees, play some golf and just like enjoy doing it together. Yeah. So what happened from there? We were making revenue, but that's when we found out profit was different than revenue. So maybe, you know, in the theme of the show, <laughs> what I wish I knew was that revenue and profit are two very different numbers. <laughs> we just weren't making any money at the end of it after like, you know, all the, all the work and we were exhausted and worn out, but we'd learned so much about marketing because like every client, I'd have to go build a brand new marketing campaign. And it was like an air conditioning unit company in Birmingham was one of them. And then I had to like help this guy in Hawaii sell like ozone generators. And then I have to sell this like PT services in Boston. And so it was just like this crash course every week in marketing, but then turned that into a course and a program on how to go basically start a similar business. We, I was really good at the sales part of the agency work, but like kind of bad at delivering it. And so I went and just started this course on how to like go land clients and kind of scale out a little consulting business, and like help others do that. And, you know, like selling a course is hard work because it's a commodity or it becomes one very, very quickly. And so you kind of just live and die off of how good your marketing can be. And so you just get amazing at like selling a product that's kind of hard to sell at scale. And so you just yeah. be incredible at like funnels and optimization and all of that. Learn how to build community, learn how to like build a tribe of people that care about this like common thing. Which we're going to come back to. As yeah, yeah. These are skills that all kind of add up to Jasper. But ultimately like, Built that up, did a bunch of coaching stuff, was sort of selling, you know, $30,000, $50,000 a year packages to people on how to grow their business and was selling $19 a month memberships to a Facebook group that's just for entrepreneurs. So kind of the whole gamut. And then we just got tired of that too. So we made the next pivot, which was a more productized version of that. And we basically said, hey, we're teaching people how to like run ads and get increased conversion rate. But what if we just did it for them? And so we started this company called Proof. Proof was Dave, JP, and Chris's first software company that they created in 2017 with Y Combinator, a startup accelerator that's helped launch thousands of successful companies, including Airbnb, Reddit, and Dropbox. And Proof was a product that helped build social proof by displaying recent customer activity on a company's website. And it was basically a little pop-up that you put on your site and showed how many people had purchased an item in the last 24 hours, or it might say, Samir bought this pair of pants six minutes ago. Yeah. It increased conversions just through social proof. And it was this whole new thing of building software that was really new to us and how do you scale it? And we ended up making a bunch of mistakes there that again, all of those things combined kind of led us to being like the right people at the right time for Jasper. One of our biggest mistakes early on, and there was so many mistakes, I mean, still are. We built ourselves into a corner where it got really hard to do any development on it. We just had all this tech debt and it wasn't kind of built using 
microservices and basically at this point where it was like you can't do anything else on this thing without having to rewrite the whole thing uh, interesting and i remember going into jasper like jp or cto had like learned that mistake and like built it to be more componentized and easier to switch out it wasn't just this kind of like monolithic app yeah but it was something that you know if, if one part got obsolete you could just go and, and rebuild it in like a week it wasn't this big thing but again, if we hadn't learned that with Proof, we probably would have done that with Jasper. And four months in, we would have painted ourselves in a corner that we can't kind of get out of there. But fortunately, we didn't. Totally. Yeah, you know, I think we just never figured out how to like make this into like a bigger platform. We ended up getting to about like $220,000 of MRR. We did Y Combinator, so like raised 2.2 million bucks there. And I think a big mistake we made was once we raised that money, we kind of thought, okay, we've got this money, we've got time to solve this platform thing. And so let's build this platform, but we'll launch it in like a year. We kind of just kicked the can, like the pain of the market down the curve, like a really long way to the point when it kind of got time to like actually launch it. We realized like we were just, we're not in touch with like what users really wanted. The people yeah. that we'd kind of been talking to were being like nice to us and we're friends and we're just kind of saying, you know, they didn't want to break our hearts. And yeah. we ended up, you know, letting go of a lot of the team at Proof and kind of, you know, figuring out what was next. But like, we kind of looked at each other. We said, you know what? We are never doing that again. Everything else we ever do, we will launch and get a user on it within a month. And we need people to start paying for it as quickly as we can. Totally. What should listeners who are founders, what should they look for to know whether what they're working on is a feature versus a company? It's basically a set and forget kind of thing where you just kind of put it on your site. And then if it works, you know, you never come back, but it's not really good to have a set and forget company in most cases. Again, sometimes that's the value prop, but in most cases you actually want your users like using it and logging in and like it becomes part of their workflow and part of their life. And there just really wasn't anything else to do. And then also like as the market got flooded with competition, pricing power drops, but we just couldn't think of anything else to build. Yeah. And even as we like talked to users, there was nothing to do. And it's funny, no other competitors to us back then ever figured out the next thing to build at all. Like proof is still probably the biggest like social proof pop-up tool in existence, but it's like a, nobody else ever like iterated past that. We tried to like make this move into like website personalization, which was like tangentially related in that what we felt like we sold was conversion rate optimization. We needed to sell to the enterprise and we were selling to like SMBs. There was a lot of work to set up. There was a bunch of edge cases around hooking into websites. That was a real pain. Yeah. And we would do all this work for company, for our customers, and they would pay us like $200 a month. That's costing us like 10000 a month to service this customer. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. we never saw a path to like it being something great. I think just like, obviously, like make sure that you've got a path to building something that you could continually iterate on. And otherwise, you could just end up with this like feature that's like easy to get commoditized and hard to keep building on. And where the unit economics have to make sense and all the, the churn rates and does that all map to the segment you're pursuing? All those things, it sounds like y'all wrestled through. You'd mentioned earlier that y'all ended up having to lay off a big chunk of the company and layoffs. Boy, I tell you, I know... They are the worst things that I have ever had to do in my professional career. They're heartbreaking. They're difficult. Any things that you learned in that process in the spirit of I wish I knew? Yeah, I mean, proof as much of like a technical like learning lesson. It was really a, it was a big crash course, in like people management. And if anything, that's kind of maybe the biggest thing that we got from it. And yeah, I think a few things that we did wrong. I mean, one, we hired everyone. And we just thought we'll teach them what they need to know. We ended up hiring this cousin of Chris, great guy. He was like an accountant. We hired him and like ultimately like, we're like, hey dude, you're our VP of sales. You need to go figure out how to do this. And you know, I don't know how to run a sales team. He doesn't know how to do it. We look around, <laughs> nobody here knows how to do it. And you know, I'm asking him to like scale this thing out and we end up just like, it doesn't work out. Not for lack of effort, but I think with Jasper this time around, I'm looking for both and I, I've learned to hire people that have seen greatness, have seen the role, have some level of competency, but are still like super hungry and maybe haven't had like the big win yet. And that has gone so much better and taken so much stress off of me from having to figure out kind of how each function is supposed to work and operate. And so like, that's what I wish I knew was hire people with more real life experience doing what you're asking them to do. 
which again, maybe sounds obvious, but I think a lot of startup advice is also like, just hire the person that's the go-getter that'll figure it out and like turn them loose. Yeah. So I think we left proof thinking, we're never gonna hire anybody again because like layoffs are painful. Like I felt bad. I felt like I, you know, sold some of my friends on this vision and then like, you know, let them down. So hard. But also like, it's just like so much work and so many problems. And I wish I knew that there were good managers that like are just like really, really good at that. Like that's what they offer to the world and they're trained and yeah. they've developed themselves in that. And it wasn't totally obvious to me at the time. I just thought all the founders had to be all the, the managers and that totally changed with Jasper. I know I've seen plenty of examples in my career of startup size companies going too far and then wanting to hire like somebody who has an unbelievable resume and pedigree and has done all these things, but they can't even remember what it was like to work in a startup. Yeah, it has just yeah. been so long ago. <laughs> and then they are just not used to working at that frenetic pace. They're not used to the lack of infrastructure and support that is so common that they got when they were at the big company. And so I think your advice there of find both is really instructive for the founders out there listening. You've got to have a mix of those kinds of people. So I think like you can have the just hungry person that hasn't seen it, but like pair them with people that know what they're doing. Totally agree with that. Coming up, having made and learned from a few missteps in his previous ventures, Dave brings his harder knowledge in hiring, goal setting, and revenue building into a sector emerging from the research labs into the hands of developers, artificial intelligence, and how Dave pivoted his career into devising his biggest creation yet, Jasper, plus the significant impact of ChatGPT on Jasper since it became accessible to the public. It was early 2021 that Jasper was founded. Our moderator, Samir, remembers when Dave took that leap to enter the AI space with Jasper. I always love to joke about how this overnight success story of Jasper is, in my mind, a decade in the making. How do you know if you're a founder whether you should be making the pivot, whether it's time? One of our companies before this, our, like, our shell company for the course company was called Pivot and Scale. It's like even for early days, mm. we love the pivot. It's been like a huge part of our story. You know, I think for us, we would just become demotivated on something. Like I'm not waking up looking forward to working on this thing anymore. And if you spend a little time thinking about something a little bit different, a lot of times we would get so excited about some new idea that it was like, I can't possibly spend another second working on this old thing. And I cannot wait to get out of bed tomorrow and work on this new thing. And like, usually we were always pulled into pivots, but I don't think people pivot in enough or fast enough and they end up kind of grinding it out because they think that they're so close. Yeah. And in my experience, everything we've done well has had signals of being really great very early on. And the things that have taken us maybe six months or a year of grinding before we kind of seen into that, like typically didn't turn out very well at all. So if you've been grinding for a long time, like at least take a week or two and kind of think, you know, if I wasn't doing this, what would I do? And I think oftentimes you'll find something that you're just like, that's it. I, I can't believe I didn't see that. I think that's great advice. And I think it takes a lot of courage to execute the pivot. Like it's so hard that you've got to be excited about it in order to like, again, put in the effort and the thinking. And you got to be like thinking about it, like while you're at dinner, like even though you're like not supposed to be because you're like with guests and like it takes that kind of zeal. And so like, if you're not excited about it, like it's just not going to work anyway, because somebody else on the other end is excited about that thing and like is going to beat you. You've got to make the pivot for it to even have a chance anyway. Dave and his co-founders next pivot was to found the startup now known as Jasper. Their startup went through a number of name changes from conversion.ai to Jarvis, named for Tony Stark's AI butler. <laughs> but Marvel wasn't thrilled about that last one. People obsess over these, you know, startup names, and then I'm on name number three of a of a pretty good company. So don't spend too much time <laughs> caring about all that. Apparently, you can change it later multiple times. But yeah, basically, I mean, we kind of spun down proof in October 2020. And I went back to kind of my old roots right after that. And I was like, oh, I'm going to start this coaching business on how to do Facebook ads for B2B SaaS companies. It's like, that's what we had done well. And that's kind of always been my like fallback. And it was funny, like in that, I think it was like week four was how to write great ad copy. And I had this formula that I'd kind of developed that we would use to like run ads for proof and all of our businesses and it worked really well. But then I would like teach it in this course 
and I would meet up with like everyone like the next week and like most of it was not good. And I was like, why are they not able to like follow? Like I'm not teaching this well enough or it's just new or whatever. And like, because it wasn't good copy that they were writing, their ads weren't going to convert. Yeah. My course wasn't going to work. And I was like, well, I could like write it all for them, but that's kind of exhausting. And I'd seen GPT-3, I'd seen some tweets and I was like, oh, the AI looks like it could maybe handle this. And so I had just seen like a way to get access through Y Combinator. And I remember texting JP, um, if we make a, a really simple front end to this API, we could build a really nice business, help people like write marketing content. And he's like, all right, I'm on it. And so JP builds this MVP over the course of like a month or so. We get on some Zoom calls with some of these customers that were in my coaching program. And I was like, hey, can I just like run this thing by you and like type in like your business name and it's gonna spit out like a headline. And like, that was magic. And people would just be like, holy bleep, give me access. Like, how can I get this today? And it was just like, people were ravenous on these Zoom calls. And up until then, like everything we'd ever done, I had never had that reaction before. Nobody was ever like beating down the door for our product. And so I was like, okay, this feels different. This feels like maybe like this product market fit thing that I'd like heard about and like yeah. always wanted. And then it was probably like the second week we decided, hey, like let's open this thing up and just like see what happens. So we built like a sign up flow, which you know, wasn't even there when we were onboarding people. There was no cancellation button for the first like month, which is a good way to like defeat churn. You know, you're like, you can't churn. But just to, just to show people like how bare bones this thing is and all the stuff that people build that you don't even really need to go and launch. And then it just like took off like week three and people were loving it. We were out of like $20,000 MRR, I think at the end of the first month. And it was just like, all right, this is off to the races. Like we kind of pivoted like all of our work. We had a couple like remaining employees that were like, stop what you're doing. Like, this is the new business. I'm like calling the team that we had just let go. And I'm like, hey, get ready. I'm coming back for you soon. Like, I think we got something here. That's awesome. It ended up, yeah, just kind of being on the wild ride that was conversion.ai and turned into Jarvis and turned into Jasper. You know, we also talk a lot about product market fit. I love talking about founder market fit. And I think there are certain problems in the world that need to be solved. But I think that the, the ones who are most successful at solving them are the right people for the job. And it really does help to have some real depth of understanding of a problem and real expertise in the area, which clearly you guys have. Yeah, and I think it's important to like your customers. Yeah. <laughs> and, and maybe that seems like a little trivial, but like I see people start businesses with customers that they don't even like and they don't really want to be around and they don't really want to hang out with. And it doesn't seem to ever go well. These marketers were like, we're our people. Like they were our crew. They were our friends. Like I liked hanging out with them and I liked sitting around and talking about marketing copy formulas with them. You've got to spend so much time with customers to make this work that if you don't like them, you're never going to put in the required amount of time to do that. And you're not going to have the empathy for them that I think you need to go build really nice products for them. And so that would just be a lesson too. It's like, do you like actually even like enjoy this market and the problem that you're solving? Because it's just a lot of work and like making money alone is not a big enough motivator to like get you over the hump of, of not even enjoying the process. So obviously with Jasper, it was incredibly popular from the jump. I remember when we were first talking, you're like, yeah, man, you won't believe it. We've got customers that are like getting tattoos <laughs> on their arm. And I think that was actually when it was still Jarvis. I don't know what they did with that. If they had to re rebrand their tattoo. One guy still has a thigh tattoo with Jarvis and the logo. Oh my God. And you know, which is the old name, but he actually loves it. He's kind of like, it's like, you know, vintage memorabilia that nobody else has. <laughs> I mean, that, that had to be an incredibly powerful moment for you all as founders to know the customer love for the service you had built was so strong. Oh, yeah. No, there was a lot of moments that first year that we just kind of would pinch ourselves and just think, is this real life? That's awesome. Now, you brought up something just a minute ago, too, that's also one topic that I know I have wrestled with my entire life which is when you're so in love with a problem that you can't turn your brain off on it because it's so it's got to get solved and you're just always thinking about it even when you're not supposed to. And yet, I know for both of us, we care a ton about family, about being good husbands and being good fathers. How have you managed to strike that balance in your own life? You know, any any words of wisdom for the listeners out there who are going on their own journeys here? Yeah, back early days, I would wake up, I don't know, maybe around nine o'clock. This is when I was you know, single and I would sit at my desk until midnight 
working and it was like amazing. I was just doing so much learning and it was fun. Again, my, my palms would be sore from sitting on top of the like the desk. But then I got married and my wife wasn't about that life. And I had made this commitment to her that I would be about her over work. And that was important to me. And so I started, you know, finishing up by six o'clock. And what I found was like, I actually got just the same amount done just in a short amount of time. Cause I just knew I didn't have all day to, to do it. And so I just kind of compressed it all and like still got to do really great work. And then you have kids and it kind of gets eaten more and more. And like you can just work smarter and you can find the hours kind of, you know, various places. And at the end of the day, like I signed up to have a family and made those commitments. So I'm just trusting that I can do both well. If I had to choose one, like I'm not doing Jasper anymore. Fortunately, I don't have to choose one, but it's like, I, like I'm the only dad that these kids will have, and I'm the only husband that my wife will have. And I want to be good at the things that are ultimately important here. And having that mental clarity on, on the prioritization helps drive lots of other smaller decisions throughout your life. It's motivating to have a family, you know, like yeah. it makes me work better at Jasper and I've got other people to do this for, and I'd love to have my boys work for Jasper someday. And it's just like, you know, it's all woven together. So these are not like two different things, but it's just a different life for sure. Let's talk a little bit about scaling. Company obviously has been growing like a weed. You have so many more employees than you did a year ago, let alone two years ago. And maybe share a little bit about what do you wish you knew about team building, leadership development, any any stuff about scaling? Yeah, we had a very weird path for scaling. I mean, the first year we basically were still like, hey, we're not going to hire anybody. We're just going to like use Zapier and automate as much as we can, which was actually like a pretty, it's remarkable how far we took this thing. You know, at the end of the year, we had I think 35 million in ARR and, and nine people, two customer support people, you know, serving 40,000 customers. And so like we actually like pushed it really, really far before we decided, hey, like, let's go for this thing here. But I wish we would have started hiring and building the team a little earlier. Yeah. You know, even six months earlier, we wouldn't have had to ramp up last year so fast, which I think it's, you know, hard and probably unwise to go from, you know, nine to 180 in a year. We ended up getting to this point where we had all these new great people, but like no one knew what we were doing and their boss joined a week before them and the boss's <laughs> boss joined a month before them. And so it was just like, it's just like a lot of context sharing all the time. And yeah. so I think... I wouldn't recommend hiring that fast and, you know, get out ahead of it a little bit. You know, this is something we did right. I mean, we hired an executive recruiter for the first time to help us go find some real good leaders in these new pools and ended up hiring a president. That was a guy that I never could have hired or even talked to without kind of an executive recruiter because I just wasn't in those circles and ended up hiring like a really good executive team with the help of that recruiter. And it's like, you know, it's 150 grand. And I was like, that's insanity. Like I would never pay that, but it's like the, most ROI positive money, you know, I've ever spent to Jasper and the trickle down effect is like so big there. So I think that's something we actually did, did right. No, it's, it's a great ROI because the benefit of having the right leader in seat over a given function is the difference between success or failure. And every function needs to be hitting in stride for the whole company to be successful. And I always use the analogy of the rowboat. You know, if the oars aren't hitting the water at the same time, you're going to be spinning around in circles as opposed to going in a straight line as fast as you want to go. We're looking for this president role. And I talked to this guy that I thought was really good. Now, I remember talking to JP and Chris. We we're like, I just found this guy. He would be amazing. And I showed him to the recruiter and he was like, what do you see in this guy? And I was like, yeah, this, that. And I was like, what do you think? He goes, well, he's not somebody like I would have ever shown to you. He's like, I think we can get somebody <laughs> like five times better. But like, you know, if this is the route you want to go, I guess we can kind of go find some more guys like this. It's like, well, okay, just show me like who you got. And then he like shows me these profiles. And I was like, I had a wrong perception <laughs> of ourselves at that point. It leveled me up so much from the type of people I wanted to hire to the type of people we were able to end up getting. Hiring an executive recruiter was something Dave had control over. But there were other things this past year that Dave and his co-founders had to learn how to deal with on the fly, including the launch of ChatGPT. You see, Jasper was created in partnership with OpenAI, an artificial intelligence startup. And on November 30th, 2022, OpenAI launched an AI chatbot called ChatGPT that people could use for free. And Dave could feel it instantly. This chatbot was going to be a game changer in the industry. I remember the first time I saw in Slack, we have a Slack channel with them. They're like, hey, we've got this new thing called ChatGPT. Check it out. 
I was like, all right, like, like, let's see what this thing was. I kind of started playing around with it. I was like, oh, this is like pretty cool. And then I, you know, you see it quickly like explode on Twitter. And then, you know, my, my dad's like asking me about this thing. And I'm like, dad, that's kind of like what we do, you know, like, like this is the space I'm in. I think for the first few weeks, it was like, yeah, I don't know what to think. It's like, is OpenAI, you know, a competitor now? Are they a partner? You know, at the end of the day, it brought a lot of awareness to the market and all these people that we'd been trying to get interested in AI. We're finally now at the table saying, hey, I heard about this over Christmas. I'd love to talk about what Jasper does. It looks like it could, it could help me too. And then there's other people that were using Jasper lightly that were saying, hey, like this thing's free. Then like, I'd rather save the money. And so we saw kind of more of the low end churn out or, you know, start asking more questions. But then again, like all these new business customers in January came to the table and like, hey, we've got to buy this for a marketing team. We want collaboration. We want role management. We want some of these other bells and whistles that Jasper had been building over the last two years. Yeah. And, and these are people that, you know, would have gotten fired for buying an AI content tool six months before. Now they're going to get fired if they don't. And that was a really quick education of the market that, you know, you know we weren't really prepared for, but it ended up, yeah, really focusing our company. It's a great lesson, I think, for founders who are thinking about when you see these kind of big disruptive events, I think sometimes it's natural for folks to overreact when oftentimes it ends up being a great thing for the business because it brings, as you described, Dave, like an unbelievable amount of market awareness on generative AI, obviously one of the most talked about categories in recent memory. Anything that you see on the horizon for that technology or the space at large and its potential for the impact to business and the world around us? Yeah, I think it's going to be enormous. I think we're still scratching the surface on the application of this. And that is opportunity for people listening. You know, like if you can take this technology that is cool in demos, but bridge the gap and make it useful for regular people, you'll be a hero. But I think we're just going to see these tools do more for people in like sophisticated ways. Like right now, Jasper will write content or make an image for you. And you kind of, you know, working with the tool and clicking the buttons and all of that. But like in the future, you'll be able to say, hey, like build a marketing campaign over this product on our website. And it'll just create 400 assets for you. It'll load them up in Active Campaign or HubSpot or whatever. It will send them for you at the right time for each segment. And that'll all just like happen. Like having this whole marketing army just like working for you all the time. And that should free up marketers to just do much better work. And it doesn't mean that creativity goes away. It doesn't mean that empathy for the customer goes away. It doesn't mean that like really understanding people deeply goes away. Like those get heightened and like those become more valuable in that world. But I don't think you'll spend as much time like fighting with email automation like stuff and like, you know, writing out, you know, all these different assets and, and all of that. So I think it's just going to like do more of the end to end stack for you. And obviously you can take that and apply it to like every team at a company that's just a marketing example. That's what we specialize in, but it'll be that way for sales and for CS and for engineering and, yep. and all these different places. You know, the, the end to end problem will be solved in a magical way. Love it. Okay. So, Dave, to get to know you a little more personally, I have five rapid fire questions for you. Are you ready? I'm ready. What are you reading or watching currently? I watched Succession the other day, which is interesting. And I'm reading a book on how the Chicago World Fair was built back in the late 1800s. Oh, interesting. All right. What's your favorite place that isn't your home or your work? Driftwood Golf and Ranch Club down the street. If you could have a stage walkout song, what would it be? The Chicago Bulls intro theme song. Love that. Which skill would you love to learn? Hunting. What do you wish you could do more of or do less of? I wish I could spend more time playing with the boys throughout the day. Yeah. All right. Final question. On the Wish I Knew podcast, we end each episode with a parting thought for our listeners as they embark on their own personal and professional journeys. So I'll ask you the same question. What do you wish you knew either before it all began or as it was unfolding? I wish I knew that the journey itself was the reward 
and that I don't know that I'm any happier than I was early days when our business was making a dollar a month. Like it's just different. And that like learning to enjoy the journey and the process and doing it with people that you like makes it effortless, almost effortless to build something. And just like learning to like enjoy the ups and the downs of it is like so key because it's a marathon and you've got to endure. And uh, if you get taken out of the race because of founder issues or because you burnt out or whatever, then like it's not going to work. And so I think, yeah, just like learn to like enjoy the journey and, and like you'll probably show up enough days in a row to make something work. That's fantastic advice. So thanks for the time today, bud. We'll catch up soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun being on the journey with you. Thanks for all the help. And I'm sure that I'll look back and laugh at all the things I didn't know on this podcast many years from now, and I'll go learn them this year. That's it for today's episode of Wish I Knew. You can find and follow the show on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, or anywhere you listen to podcasts, or at bvp.com slash wish I knew. A special thanks to our guest, Dave Rogan Moser, for coming on today's show. Wish I Knew is a podcast by Bessemer Venture Partners. The show is created by our very own Karen Lee and Christine Deekers. I'm your host, David Cowan. Our show is produced by the team at Philia Media. Our lead producer is Molly Getman. Our executive producer is Kate Walsh. We're engineered by Evan Viola. Our theme music is by Terry Devine King at Audio Network. Additional music by Blue Dot Sessions. And remember, if you've been grinding for a long time and aren't seeing results, ask yourself, if I weren't banging my head against the wall trying to make this work, what other exciting opportunity would I pursue? We'll see you in our next episode.